always had a problem with what wine do you serve with Thanksgiving? What's your favorite wine, Bob? Well, I don't want to go to my mother-in-law's again. I don't want to go there either. <laughs> Let's go to the wine vault. Let's go to the wine vault. All right. Welcome to Cellar to Cellar. I'm Bob Stanley, and this is Bob Roth. And this week on the program, we're going to take you through four different wines. That's nothing different. With a bonus wine at the end, we're going to answer some of the questions you've always asked, including Bob Roth. <laughs> I don't know, including what? Including, I thought all wines will get better with age. We're going to come oh, yeah. down to that one at the very end of the program. That's right. I know. I'm not getting better with age, and uh, I'm... You know, you understand that. Stay tuned and don't touch that dial. Be right back with more Cellar to Cellar after these words from our sponsor. Welcome back to Cellar to Cellar. Today, Bob and I are talking about uh, bubbly. And, uh, you know, we always try to bring uh, things that are tasty and affordable to you. You know, you don't have to go out and spend a a ton of money to get some really, really great bubbles. And these two are really highly rated and they're fairly priced. And uh, they're actually uh, representative of two different types of fermentation when it comes to, to wine. Now, you know, Champagne uh, has to come from the Champagne region of France. These do not, although they're both French, they're not actually called Champagne. Uh, they're a sparkling wine uh, by international decree. And uh, what's the first one we're going to do, Bob? Are we going to do two, or are we just going to do this one right here? Well, let's do this one right now. Okay, great. The reason I show this wine tonight, Bob Roth, who is very busy during the week, he said, Bob Stanley, you set up the show, and you'll show up. That's right. <laughs> like the prima donna that you are. And there you are. That's fine. So I set it up, and I thought, when you go into a restaurant, and you're not really into wine, you don't know wine, and the pressure's on, and what do I order? It's a table of four. And I don't know if they're going to order for wine, you know, order for food. This is the only wine you can have before, during, and after the meal. And it goes well with seafood. It actually can go well with meat, believe it or not, because of the bracing acidity of champagne. That's right. Which this is not. But it's made in the method champagne you know, which is, uh, which is a secondary fermentation method for all of you wine geeks out there. Of course, they... Uh, they ferment it and then they put a dosage in the bottle to, and recork it. It's really what is a dosage? Well, it's a little, a little bit of sugar they put in there. The interesting thing about the, that whole area, it's actually pretty far north to ripen grapes, you know? So there's not a lot of sugar in the grapes like there is out in California. The French get so PO'd at the California guys because they get great crops every year. And they're going to struggle in France and, and some of the other countries of the world. They don't necessarily have the weather that, that California enjoys. So uh, that's why uh, somebody like, uh, uh, who is the great champagne blender? Uh, gosh, it The monk? Me. Was he a monk? Was no, he a wine he monk? Was, what was his name? Come on, Bob. Dom Perignon. Dom Perignon. He was a master blender. And that's what he would do is he'd take wine from year to year. And uh, he had good years, bad years, and we're going to throw it away. So uh, they would blend it together and try to keep up with, uh, make a, a real dependable wine every year. And the funny thing about Dom Perignon is he never had a glass of sparkling wine. In his time, uh, if it was sparkling, it was kind of considered in poor taste, actually. So he was a master blender of, of the, the wines from that region, which is mostly the Chardonnay and Pinot Noir grapes. And in that region, during the Dom Perignon era. Um, actually, it was a textile area where they made these fine still wines, not sparkling wines, and they gave them as gifts. And the Germans, the Germans were the traders, the merchants in Europe. And the Germans knew all the languages. That's why if you notice a lot of the champagne houses like Bollinger, um, Keith Anderson, what other names are there? The German guys. There's, most of the houses in Champagne are German names. And then when Dom Perignon, he actually blew it. He, he put the, the, the still wine down in the cellar 
and was still working. There was still sugar and yeast in there working, and it blew off the corks. And he went down there and said, oh, I guess we got to do something with this, and he poured it. And people kind of liked the champagne. There's two different stories in that bottle. But this year, we want to thank Varietals and More on Royal Palm Point because they provided a lot of these. Yes! Thank you very much. And Rob and Michelle will be here later on. And I see some of the vendors are coming in tonight. Hi, Dina. To pour some of their wines. All right, Bob, we have to, we're slave to a timer. What's our set here? Four minutes? Are we done? 4.5. All right. Otherwise, no, four minutes, 30 seconds. Well, stay tuned. We'll be right back with another episode or another uh, segment of Seller to Seller. <laughs> Welcome back, Seller to Seller reunion program here at the Heritage Center. I'm Bob Stanley. And Bob Roth, for once we have a huge audience. We're not just all by ourselves at the deck with Mary cooking supper for us in the, in the back room. And, and, uh, and me throwing wine off the deck. That's, that's right. right. If you remember the first program we did at my house, right here, if we didn't like the wine, we'd throw it off the deck. And we had the sound effect hammer. Right, Sean? Yeah. Crash! And I still remember a couple of years later, I'm messing around in the ferns, cleaning the yard. And here's a bottle of white Merlot from France. <laughs> As you get mad, yeah, that's out the deck. <laughs> that was gone, that was gone. Well, the next wine is really kind of a, a misunderstood I wine. I mean, it's something that people are, are really don't embrace, I don't think, very much. And, oh, well, you know, Bob, you're the bad guy now. You got the black hat. All right. I got the white hat. Amen. Bob is not a fan of this grape. Well, let's put it this way. I drink a lot of red wine, and, uh, <laughs> or even like a dark pink wine, but uh, I don't drink a lot of white wine. There's nothing wrong with it. It's just that I like to like skip right to the, the main, main course here. Whatever. Oh, you like meat and potatoes. That's right. But this wine here, it's a much maligned grape, I feel. And lately in the press, last couple of years anyway, sommeliers are really hot about this wine, or cool about it, because it's a cool wine. And I love it. I've always loved this wine. Any guesses out there in the audience as to what we have here in our glass? Well, let, and let me give you a little, a little lesson here that someone taught me many years ago. It's nice to stir your wine up a little bit to, to get the bouquet. But the whole secret is if you, don't, if you keep your glass on the table and you spin it around, you can spin it around as hard as you want and you won't spill it. But if you pick it up off the table and spill it around, it's going to end up on your shirt. So uh, keep it on the table and twist it around and you get that bouquet. Oh, that's why you want to twist it. Ah. You want to open it up and get the esters. That's right. The esters flowing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Is it Moscato? That's a good guess. Moscato. Similar aromas. I can tell people like Keith Anderson sitting there going, I know what it is. <laughs> what do you smell? There's an aroma that's very distinct. Perhaps you smelled it at the gas station. <laughs> is there a hint of petrol? A hint of diesel? Yes, there is. That's always a telltale sign of this particular grape variety. And of course, this grape variety is Riesling. And one of the wonderful things about this particular Riesling, I know we've got to move it right along here, um, is this is, is really a higher end Riesling, uh, Eroica, and it's uh, Dr. Lucen. Dr. Lucen, here is his great bottle from um, Germany. The family's been around 200 years from the Mosul. So Lucen and. And one of the most famous winemakers in America that's got behind uh, Riesling uh, for many, many years before anybody else did. And uh, it was Chateau Saint Michel. I'm not sure what his name was, but. Uh, the, those two winemakers got together and they wanted to really promote uh, Riesling in the United States. And most Americans used to think that Riesling was sweet. So they go, I don't want to drink sweet wine. But Riesling is all over the place from, from very dry to very sweet. And there's some wonderful dry Rieslings that you can have uh, paired well with, with uh, many dishes. And in Florida, Riesling is really an excellent wine because of the hot weather we have. It's very refreshing. And uh, it really uh, is a great wine for the afternoon by the pool. It's always white fruit, like peaches, pears, nectarines, the hint of the diesel, which is not that bad a thing. And this is slightly sweet, that's it. 
And as you mentioned, even in Germany, they make sparkling wine on the Riesling called Sat. I love to say that word. S-E-K-T. Pronounce it correctly. So anyway, you can buy the Eroica down at Bridals and more as well. And what I love about doing live shows, we've done a few in the past, Bob, is as a little alcohol is consumed, people have fun. I hear a lot of laughter out there. we got to take a break, though. That's right. Stay tuned. We'll be right back with more Cellar to Cellar. someplace on uh, Provence, France, I guess, and we're drinking pink wine, something I never thought I would ever drink in my entire life. But uh, I think I was spoiled. Uh, I mean, I was kind of frightened as a child by a, a glass of uh, white Zinfandel. And, uh, you know, I never really uh, wanted to taste any other wine that looked that color ever again after I tasted it. But uh, let me tell you, this, is, this wine, it really impressed me. It's actually... Uh, turned me around, and from the first time that uh, the first person that actually put a bottle of this in my hand was Rob Wayne. I, I don't, because we don't really do the show anymore, uh, I don't really study wine like I used to. Rob's got his thumb beat on, uh, on the pulse of the wine industry, and I just walk in, I, and as you all should, and say, Rob, what should I be drinking? He said, here, drink this rosé. And it was absolutely, uh, I'll even drink it with this fly in it, it tastes so good. But, uh, but you're a vegetarian, Bob. It is. But uh, the interesting interesting part of- uh, That's a huge fly, <laughs> too, <laughs> isn't it? Is a, 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 a close up on this? He's a very drunk fly, I might add. Anyway, the, uh, so the, the name of this wine is Whispering Angel. And Whispering Angel is, it's kind of become the new Mayomi, believe it or not. You know how the if some of you are familiar with Mayomi, it just kind of took off. You saw it on wine list. Everybody's asking for a Mayomi. Uh, there's a Pinot Noir that became very famous. There's an interesting story about that, that after the show, if anybody want to know, I'll be happy to share that with you, how it got so uh, so famous. But Because there's some cuss words involved. <laughs> no, but this is, I uh, don't want to take up any time from this, but uh, but this is really, really a very special wine. But talk about this, Bob. It's, it's we mean the whispering angel, as we like to call it. Let me get this fly out here. Yeah, there really was. Oh, oh. oh and he's still alive. And he's kind of wobbly. He's, too, not, he's not flying very well. But, uh, whispering angel. They came around, <laughs> I think, 2007 in southern France, and it didn't sell very well, but kept trying and trying. The nice thing about rosé wines, or as a category nowadays they call orange wines, because look at the color. This really isn't rosé, it's orange. And in Inu River County, I hate to call it orange wine because, oh, is that navel or is that Valencia? No. Okay. But it's, it's really, you're drinking all the aspects and characteristics of a red grape in a white wine. Because obviously you have to squeeze a black skin grape to make a rosé, or to make a red wine, in this case, a rosé. And this probably has, what, about eight wine varieties in it? Uh... And it's kind of like the, what they do in Bordeaux. I mean, are they five? Five. Okay. They, like in Bordeaux, the reason they have so many different uh, varieties is that, is that different uh, grapes come uh, ripe at different times of the year. And they have the rains that come across the English Channel. And they, they try to harvest just, you know, the rain comes just before harvest. And it's the, the grapevines pick up a lot of water and it kind of ruins the crop. It's not so concentrated. So uh, blending is a way to get a real uh, uh, constant or a really excellent uh, crop from year to year. They'll, and that's why the blend will change uh, depending on, on the seasons, on the farming. And this, like, they, like the one uh, grape variety they have is R-O-L-L-E, what is it, Roll? Roll, which is also known in Italy as Odino would know over there. I forget right now, but yeah. But you know, they, they put things in like that, maybe just for the nose, just for the bouquet. That's all. And uh, and the interesting part about Whispering Angel, like you find some rosés that are like nine dollars a bottle. This one's around twenty. Why so much? Uh, what they do is they only harvest these grapes. Uh, in the morning, like after 12 o'clock, they quit picking because it they, they, uh, just gets too hot. And they only use very small baskets when they pick them because they don't want the grapes that are at the bottom of the basket to get crushed. 
So, I mean, they, they pay that kind of concentration on their process, and as they run them through, I know we're going over a little bit, as they run them through, they have computers that scan the grapes to make sure they're consistent size and everything else. And they used to do that by hand, not by computer. And Whispering Angel is the only wine you can drink from midday till midnight. That's right, it's wonderful. <laughs> and with that, we're gonna break off again and come back to our final segment this week on Cellar to Cellar. Stay tuned, we'll be right back. Thank you very much for being here. I do want to thank Boston Barricade. They made this great backdrop for us. And this is my deck. This photo was taken two weeks ago. So Boston Barricade, they did it gratis. Thank you very much. All right, Bob. What do we got in front of us? We have well, two red wines. I had the pleasure. This is Fidelity. And it's a blended red wine. Comes from Alexander Valley. I had the, the pleasure of meeting uh, Nick Goldschmidt, who is the winemaker, and he's a very interesting guy. He's one of the uh, the most uh, innovative guys uh, in winemaking today. Matter of fact, he was responsible, part of the team, that did Cloudy Bay. I don't know if any of you remember Cloudy Bay, but it kind of put New Zealand on the map as far as Sauvignon Blanc goes 20-some years ago. That was just so surprising. The New Zealand Sauvignon Blancs were filled with grapefruit, and they were so different than the, uh, the Sancerre and the Puy Fumé and, uh, and the Fumé Blanc from uh, Robert Mondavi. Mm -hmm. It was just uh, it was just exciting wine. So he was part of that team and uh, he then uh, moved to the United States. I mean, he moved around. He, he's actually consulting on probably up to 45 different wineries. He goes to South America, he goes to Europe. and But he has his winery in Alexander Valley and this is one of the things that he makes. And, one of the things that I like about him is he makes uh, wine that's that's very affordable, and I think is this a blend? I think of Zinfandel and Syrah, if I'm not mistaken. Well, it doesn't say on the label, so I think you're right, Bob. It is. You can taste okay. it. Just smell it. Zinfandel. I've got it. I've got it right here. <laughs> okay. Ah, Zinfandel and Syrah. He's got the, the nose like a you know, a computer chip. So he's a flying rye maker, as we call him. And the other glass you have in front of you is the Seña, which was made in Chile back in the late 90s and early 2000s. The combination got together Robert Mondavi and Baron Mutan Rashio. If you can, if you can refrain from tasting it quite yet, though. And it's just uh, an example of, here we have a fresh Fidelity's Red Blend 2015, and the Seña you have is anywhere, because there's three bottles out there, you could have the 96, 97, or 99. That's old yeah. wine. So uh, one thing we have learned is that, uh, well, should we let them have a taste of that? Take, taste the Sanya at this point, if you've had the, the Fidelity, and tell us what you think of that, com by comparison. Now, the Sanyas came out of my cellar. I'm the idiot that stored them for 20 years, so I can talk about my wine very derogatorily. Is that a word? It is, but this it but smells Bob, like rotten eggs. But Bob, Bob has stored this wine impeccably since he purchased it. From the time he bought this wine, it went right to his wine cellar. It's been properly kept and temperature controlled. It probably didn't made its first step out of the cellar today. It's probably been sitting in there since 1996, and yet it sucks. <laughs> All right, Bob. Yeah. It's my yeah. wine, Bob. <laughs> Now, why is that? <laughs> and, that <laughs> and nothing is worse. I, sometimes I'll, I'll, uh, I call on, on clients in town here, and uh, those of them that knew that I had the wine show, they'd, they'd probably pull a, a, a fine bottle of Bordeaux off of their rack and say, we got this as a wedding gift back in 1963, and we're saving it. <laughs> you know, <laughs> for a special occasion. And I have to say that special occasion is long gone because uh, that wine should be, you know, and people, when they say, oh, what should I do with it? Never ever pull the cork out of it because if the cork is in a bottle like that, it's a special bottle and it's a special memory. As soon as you pull the cork out of it, it's crap. <laughs> 
And worse off, if I pull it out and, and it's gone sour, I'll cook with it. I'll cook oh, with that's, it. that's great. <laughs> cook with nasty ingredients. <laughs> Alan's a chef here in the audience. Would you do that? No. Come on. No. Well, Bob, I'll tell you what. We're, we're run out of time. We have so much fun because we have a live audience. We usually stick right to it. You guys have made it fun. This is our last official show. We're done. We're done. I'm finally collecting Social Security. I can hardly wait. <laughs> <laughs> well, here's to you for showing up and supporting the Heritage Center. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank all of you here, and thank you for joining us on another thrilling episode of Seller to Seller. Bob, I'm glad we had a last gig at the Heritage Center. Couldn't ask for a better spot. Well, nothing says Vero Beach like the Heritage Center, does yeah, it? Yeah, it's been a great 20 years. Buddy. It's a good run. Love you, brother. We're done now. Can you believe that?